Hello there, everyone. Welcome to Lady Berean Bible Study. I'm Michelle Snyder, and I'm so happy you've joined us. This week, we've studied John 6, verses 16 through 21. I'm going to have you stop the recording right now. I want to pause and give you a chance to read those verses, and then we'll come back together. So we are starting here with verse 16 and going through 21, and it says, Now when evening came, his disciples went down to the sea. Well, to pick you up with where we were last week, that was the feeding of the, it says 5,000, but we know it was more, because if it said 5,000 men, so if there had been a wife and children for each man, uh, it would have been significantly more than 5,000. They had had a very very busy day and so it says here that it's evening time and they got into the boat and went over the sea toward Capernaum and it was already dark and Jesus had not come to them so the sun is going down the crowd is still there and Jesus tells his disciples to take off and cross the lake and that he would meet them there and as always is the case when Jesus said something, they did. I love those places in God's word where God said to do this and the very next verse said, and so they did it. Well, this was one of those occasions. But according to Mark, and we're going to look in Mark here a little bit later, but if you want to check and write this down, Mark 6, 45, the Bible says that Jesus compelled, that means forced or pressured his disciples to embark and go back across the lake. Perhaps he saw that they were being infected with the crowd's excitement. You know, that kind of mob enthusiasm that can happen when <laughs> things go crazy. Um, we don't know why he sent them there. But as it says in verse 17, it was already dark. So it had been one very, very long day. And several of the disciples were fishermen. We've got to remember that and keep that in mind because they knew what they were doing. They were accustomed to fishing on this very lake multiple times and when they got into the boat the thought of rowing across the lake at night didn't concern them at all now with me but <laughs> they were fine with it um but it, then the bible says that jesus had not come to them well this actually was the second time jesus dealt with his disciples on a stormy sea of galilee in the first storm, we can find that in Matthew 8, verse 24, Jesus was present with them in the boat. Remember that? And he rebuked and he calmed the storm. In this storm, Jesus asked his disciples to trust his unseen care and concern for them. So in the other storm, Jesus was there. It's easier to trust someone that we can touch and feel, right? But he's asking them to trust his unseen presence. And that's what he asks us to do every single day. Let's look at John verse uh, 6, verse 18. It says, then the sea arose because a great wind was blowing. Well, we often face spiritual and emotional storms and feel tossed about, don't we? Just like, like a small boat on a big lake. Have you ever been there? Yet in spite of terrifying circumstances, if we trust our lives to Christ for his safekeeping, he will give us peace in any storm. Faith, you know, is, is a mindset uh, that expects God to act. Do you have that kind of faith? When we act on this expectation, ladies, we can overcome any fear. And I know some of you are fearful right now about things that are scary, but fix your mind on the unseen Jesus and hide and watch and see what he will do. That's what I love about this story, because, you know, one after the other, we've been studying all the miracles of Jesus and, and this is no different what happens here on the lake. So Matthew added that this storm raged for a long period of time. Um, he said it was the fourth watch of the night, which means it could have been like six in the morning, 
even three o'clock in the morning. And Jesus had dismissed them when the sun was going down. So that is a long, long time of battling high winds and high waves. And Jesus came to them then in the storm. And he comes to us today in the storms of life, our personal storms. He makes himself more real to us, ladies, in a time of trouble and sorrow than he ever does when we're on the mountaintop. I don't know why he waits until the midnight hour. Raise your hand. If he has waited until the midnight hour to act on behalf of you and your need, yes. I don't know why he waits until the waves are rolling, but perhaps, just perhaps, that is the only time that we, us, all of us here, will listen to him. When the storms of life are beating upon us, our hearts are ready for his presence. Isn't that the truth? So immediately, it says, the ship was at the land. Now, this may be another miracle. Or, you know, John may mean that with no delay, they reached the other side. We really don't know what John meant here. Um, be but because the water was so calm now, maybe they could just, you know, paddle on over and get there as quick as they could. Or uh, maybe it's the language of love with him, with Jesus in the boat. It didn't seem like it took very long at all. We don't know. And it could be that they were just ooh, beamed up and right there at the beach. The Sea of Galilee was and is well known for its sudden violent uh, storms that quickly make the lake very, very dangerous. Another interesting note here is that um, it this sea is 600 feet below sea level. So, so here's the sea. And, and the lake, got the Sea of Galilee, is clear down here. When the sun sets, the air cools. And as the cooler air from the west rushes down over the hillside, it creates a wind that churns up the lake. And since the disciples were rowing toward Capernaum, they were heading into the wind, right into the wind. Consequently, <laughs> they made very little progress. I can identify with that. If any of you know my friend, Amy Eilers, ask her about what she and I went through on the Snake River. We came across a headwind that was stronger than the current. We thought we were being really smart, putting in upstream, and then we were just going to float downstream and have a nice relaxing day. We were going to end up uh, at the boat docks there in Burley. Well, it didn't turn out to be that way because the wind that we were fighting was actually stronger than the current. And I had never worked so hard. And if we stopped, well, we just couldn't stop. We just had to keep going because if you stop even for a second, you know what's going to happen? You're going to drift backwards. And so you did all that paddling for nothing. <laughs> and so we couldn't stop. And I remember I kept telling her, well, it's just around the corner, the, the net, not corner. It's just around the curve. It's the very next curve and we'll, we'll be there. And we would go and, and gave us hope, you know, and we were paddling and just couldn't wait to get around that curve. And it wasn't, and we weren't there. And so we'd paddle some more and we'd see another curve. But, oh, it's this curve. This is, we can do it. We can do it. And so curve after curve after curve, that river is a lot longer than we anticipated. Oh boy, ask me the story. How did it end? Um, we were absolutely exhausted. We did get to the end, but God provided for us before we were at the very end in a miraculous way. And so uh, please do ask me. I'm not going to take any more time explaining that now, but it was another miracle of God. But I understand what those disciples were going through. And so let's look at verse 19 here where it says, so when they had rowed about three or four miles, that's a long, long ways, especially if you're fighting a storm. They saw Jesus and he was walking on the sea and drawing near to the boat. 
And they were sore afraid. <laughs> in the first storm upon the Sea of Galilee, the disciples were terrified. Again, in Matthew 8, you can read that. Uh, in the beginning of the second storm, they were more frustrated than they were afraid because they were exhausted. So they rode hard for perhaps six to eight hours and had only come a little more than halfway across the lake, which was about three or four miles. So when you hear Jesus was walking on the water, some people would say, oh, he was just on the beach. It just looked like it. No, there was no beach in sight. They were in the middle of the lake. And the lake is somewhere I read 150 feet deep. You know, it's kind of hard to walk on water when it, that's 150 feet deep. So they were in this place of frustration at the, at, you know, and it was at the will of Jesus. Jesus told them to do it and they did exactly what he told them to do. That is what it means to walk with Christ. So additionally, in Mark 6, 48, uh, it says that Jesus watched the disciples as they rode across the lake. He was watching. His eye was on them, ladies, the whole time. His eyes are on us when we go through our storms. They were in the perfect will of Jesus, and they were being watched by Jesus yet working hard in frustration <laughs> the whole time. Do you ever feel like you're there? And sometimes when that happens, we doubt that maybe we got out of God's will. Maybe we're not supposed to be here. This is too hard. I don't think God's in this. No, this story proves that it is not that way. They saw Jesus walking on the sea, and yes, they were afraid. If we look at Matthew 6, 49 and 50, it says the disciples were afraid, because they thought Jesus walking on the water was a ghost. They didn't recognize him. Jesus had given them, we need to remember this, plenty of reasons to trust his supernatural help. <laughs> they may have even taken some of the 12 basket leftovers of bread with them. Who knows? But John 6 verse 13 says, that they were still, even after what they had just seen, they were still shocked when the supernatural help came to them on the sea. Let's look at John 6, 20, the calming words of Jesus. Oh, the calming words of Jesus. Raise your hand if you've ever experienced that. You know, that's what we find when we pick up this book, isn't it? So Jesus said, it is I, do not be afraid. For Jesus, it was enough to announce his presence. That should have done it. He was with his disciples and would meet them in their frustration and fear. And he says, do not be afraid. He says that to us today. Jesus came to bring supernatural help and comfort to his disciples. We're his disciples if we've trusted him as Savior. His presence gave them what they needed, even though he came in in an unexpected way. His presence gives us what we need, even though he sometimes comes in in an unexpected way. So we know from Matthew 14, 28 through 32, that after this, Peter asked Jesus if he could come out and walk on the water. You all know the story. And Peter did. He walked on the water for a really short time. And the other gospels actually go into that part of the story, but John leaves it out. But in verse 21, he says, Then they willingly received him into the boat. <gasps> they received him into the boat. And immediately the boat was at the land where they were going. And that's what I was saying earlier. The implication was that Jesus would not come unless he was willingly received. Do you remember John 1 12 that says to as many as received him to them, he gave the right to become children of God. We have been offered a gift by a loving father. And that gift is 
the Lord Jesus Christ and his death, burial, and resurrection for the salvation, for our salvation, for the forgiveness of sin. And he's a gentleman. You know what? He doesn't force his way in. And so where it says they willingly received him, I have to ask you, have you willingly received him? Even as he was walking on the Sea of Galilee, Jesus waited to be welcomed by his disciples. Have you invited him in? Have you received him? Have you joyfully welcomed him into your life? If you haven't, he's waiting. He's still there. Call on him. Invite him in. Invite him in to be your Lord and Savior and to make you into the woman that he wants you to be. And as we talked about earlier, it says immediately the boat was at the land where they were going when they had willingly received him into the boat. That is what caused the miraculous to happen. This was indeed a remarkable miracle. From this detail given by John, it is inferred that the ship seemed to move automatically without sail or oar in obedience to his will. So that without effort, any effort at all of the disciples or crew, it quickly passed over the remaining distance, which was two miles or so, and came to shore. We don't know how it happened but the Bible says it did. One could say that Jesus rescued his disciples from frustration and futility. He wants to rescue us from the same. Jesus wants us, ladies, to work hard, but he never wants us to work in futility. Their work had not been a waste, the disciples, but it needed the touch of the divine power and presence. Think about what you're doing. Think about your work. It's not a waste, but it needs the touch of divine power and presence, whatever your work happens to be. So what is the takeaway? There are times in a believer's life when at the Lord's direction, we can enter into some very, very scary circumstances. There are times even at God's direction, where we are walking in obedience to the Lord. And we can still walk into scary circumstances. Just because we're doing what he said does not mean that we won't have trouble. The disciples found themselves in a very dangerous, frightening situation. And they were there because Jesus told them to be there. When we talk about Jesus doing and saying things, we are seeing God doing and saying things. He says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I have a question for you. And it's not a rhetorical question. I want you to answer it inside your own heart. Would God ever ask you to do something or go somewhere or be something that would result in personal danger to you? Would God do that? <laughs> yes, he would. not It's what happened with the disciples. But it doesn't mean he's not going to take care of you. God will allow and even direct us in the path of storms from time to time. But it's not for naught. All things work together for good to those who are called according to his purpose. To those who love him, do you love him? Are you called? Then trust. Maybe he's calling you to work on improving your marriage and suddenly a storm blows up. Maybe you're trying to walk in obedience to raising children in a godly home and a storm blows into the situation. It's during those times that some people begin to question whether they are doing what the Lord wanted them to do. And it's horrible when you find yourself in that place, when there's nothing but debris, when there's utter chaos, and you think, maybe God didn't want me to do this. 
That is being a circumstantial Christian, ladies. If Paul would have assessed his ministry on that premise, he would have quit the first day. Please, I beg you, and I'm talking to myself here, do not be a circumstantial Christian. Instead, the question is, did God tell you to walk this way? If he did, then stay the course and just know that the Lord is guiding you. Yes, it is painfully painful. <laughs> I mean, doubly painful sometimes when we find ourselves in those places. Uh, the disciples were straining at the oars. And that's what we do, isn't it? We decide that if it's getting hard, we just need to double down and work harder, grit our teeth and make things happen. Can you relate? Do you do that? I want to see a raise of hands here. When the going gets tough, the believer, believers just try harder, don't we? Some of you are in a storm right now, and you're there because you feel the Lord directed you in a particular way, and now it's not going very well. What you're doing is straining at the oars. You're making progress painfully under your own strength. You're facing difficulty in the midst of, of obedience. And that's okay. You, you're thinking, though, I have to do better. I have to work harder. I have to get this thing done. And then we operate in the power of self. There have been many, many brothers and sisters in Christ who showed their love for the Lord when they were called to do something for his purpose with his strength. He never intended for us to carry it out on our own strength. Not ever. It's God's energy, and there is nothing wrong with hard work. But when it comes to the following of the Lord, doing what he wants you to do, look at Ephesians 6 10. He says, Be strong in the strength of his might. When God calls, directs, and sends you, and you run into a storm, be strong in the strength of his might. Who is God but the Lord? And who is a rock except our God, the God who equipped me with strength for the battle? Oh, I love the verse where it talks about the, the deer on um, hinds feet in high places, the place in Psalms. Uh, God made me like a deer. My footing was secure and I was able to dance across what was. How do we get there? What steps can we take to get into the place where we're relying on his strength and not our own? Well, let's learn what the disciples did. Immediately, the boat was at the land. Their assigned task was accomplished, not by means of self, not by my power and my might, God says, but by uh, the power and presence of the Lord, because he had dominion over that thing. We're not going to be perfect, ladies, in our responses 100% of the time. When Peter saw the wind, he was afraid, and he sank, and he cried out, Lord, save me, and Jesus pulled him up. There have been times in my life where he's done the same, where he had to reach down, and he had to pluck me out of self-doubt and fear. Peter started off quite well. He rose up with faith. Peter did pretty well until he got his eyes off the Lord and then he started to sink. Don't take your eyes off of him. Don't look at the circumstances. Don't look at the waves crashing all around you. You keep your face and your eyes focused on him. And we look and we go, oh, that's a big one. This one's going to take me down. Lord, save me. <laughs> And you know what? Jesus is always right there to lift you up out of that place of doubt and fear if you call upon him and trust him. You say, this is too big for me, but it's not too big for you. And I need to learn how to trust you, Lord. I want to put things in your hands. I want to trust you with the outcome. We recognize that nothing is too difficult for you, Lord. You are the God of the impossible. And we invite you into our storm-battered ship. 
we invite you into our circumstances, into our family drama and our financial woes or our health problems and all the addictive behaviors that we deal with. We invite you into all the besetting areas of sin in our lives. Help us, Lord, to keep our eyes on you for the victory and to stop straining against the oars in our own strength because we are getting nowhere fast. We want to walk this calling out, Lord, and get to the other side, just like the disciples did. And we invite you into our boats, and we trust you to see us through. Jesus on the cross, help us to remember that. Help us to remember that empty tomb. Come into our hearts and lives, Lord. Be our Savior. Teach us of yourself. Make us into the women you want us to be. In your most holy and precious name, amen. <laughs>